Well, welcome everybody. Uh, so this is my, my first lecture in about probably six months. I took a little time off because I was busy with clinic work. Um, but this is a lecture called My Your Posture, and we're going to be discussing how your posture affects your health. All right. My name is Dr. Scott Jan. I'm a chiropractor. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a chiropractor is, a uh, chiropractor is basically um, a doctor that uh, concerns themselves with uh, the holistic side. So we don't um, turn to drugs or medications or surgeries. Uh, we look at the whole body to a holistic means, right? Looking at the whole person. Uh, so we concern ourselves with uh, proper framework, which is what we're going to be discussing today, which would be under the physical. Uh, also, uh, chiropractors uh, discuss and look at um, chemical issues like diet and also um, toxicity, and as well as mental emotional aspects. Right. So when we look at the, our posture, our human frame, we, right? Um, kind of first question is kind of why are we looking at it, right? And uh, the reason why we look at posture is because our posture. Um, is kind of helps define what our health is. It's a mirror into our health because when patients have proper posture, when people have proper posture, right, they're going to use a lot less energy um, to be upright and to, to move and to be mobile. Um, and as the posture breaks down, so does the body, which we're going to see uh, in a moment. Um, let's first discuss what we're going to talk about, right? So what we're gonna cover first is we're gonna look at what proper posture is, and then we'll talk about why it's important. Uh, we'll talk about the most common posture distortions, and I'll show you guys how to check yourself to see if um, you suffer from any of these things. Uh, we'll talk about why uh, some possibilities are that you uh, would have these postures and some lifestyle considerations. And then most importantly, what everybody kind of wants to know is how to fix it, okay? And then we'll wrap it up. All right, so hopefully this won't take more than an hour. All right, I'll try and keep it within that time frame because I know people get antsy. All right, so proper posture, what are we looking at? So uh, the best way is to look from the side, right? It'll tell you more than the, the back front, but they're, they're both important. So when we look from the side, what you want to do is you want the ear to line up with the shoulder, right? Uh, roughly, or it doesn't have to be exact, but Primarily, the ear should be over the shoulder, which then should be over the midline of the hip, or what's called the greater trochanter, which is uh, the um, bone uh, that sticks out on the femur or the leg bone. And then it should pass right through the mid of the knee and towards um, the what's called the lateral malleolus or that ankle bone, that bone that sticks out on the ankle. All those should line up. Okay. Anything off of that, and your body is going to start using uh, muscle, muscle to hold itself up as opposed to the skeleton, which is what it's supposed to use to hold it up. Okay. And then when we look from the back or the front, you can just get a mirror, right? Uh, you want your eyes to be center line, right? Uh, if someone's looking at you, uh, have them look at your ears, right? Make sure the ears are lined up. Look from the back. Okay. Uh, shoulders should be uh, properly aligned. Usually we'll see one shoulder higher than the other, especially with women um, or anybody who carries a bag over one side of their, uh, their body. The hip should line up and you should just uh, be able to put your hands on top of the hip bones and see if they line up. Uh, the knees should be uh, aligned and then the ankles again. And the foot uh, should not cave in uh, or cave out. All right. Okay, so why does this matter, right? Well, it matters for several reasons, right? Number one is joint degeneration, right? The best way I can describe joint degeneration is if you think about a car tire, right? Everybody knows that if your car doesn't have proper wheel alignment, you'll get what we see here, right? One part of the tire uh, on this side is looking like it's brand new, and then the other side looks like it's ready to blow out. <clears throat> this is because the car doesn't, the tire doesn't sit properly on uh, the road, right? It's sitting too much on one side versus the other. So you get too much wear and tear, which is exactly what we see when we don't have our proper posture, right? We get joint degeneration, otherwise known as arthritis. And this arthritis is uh, unfortunately irreversible. So other things we can affect and make change with, you really can't uh, reverse a degenerative joint. It's, it's like that way for life. Okay. okay. Next thing we look at is our herniated discs, right? Our spine is our, our lifeline. And those discs, if the joints are not sitting perfectly on top of each other, those bones, the vertebrae, uh, you'll get 
too much pressure on one side of the joint versus the other. And same thing like the joint, uh, like the bones, they'll start to degenerate and, and eventually break down to get either what's called degenerative disc disease or uh, what's worse is a herniated disc. You can also get increased heart rate and blood pressure, okay, or decreased circulation um, due to uh, muscle spasm and things like that. You get reduced uh, lung capacity by as much as 30%. So your diaphragm uh, has a full range of motion when we are upright. And when we're bent forward or in a forward uh, head posture or, or a collapsed posture, it causes a lot more work to breathe. I mean, if you're sitting down right now, all you do is just sit up straight, take a nice deep breath in, and then try bending forward and breathing in again. You'll see this so much more labor intensive to bend forward and breathe in than if you were sitting upright, right? So um, that's an important aspect to why we want a proper posture. Because as we do decrease lung capacity, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get uh, very acidic in the body because you're not getting as much oxygen in the body. So the body's gonna get very acidic. It's gonna collect a lot of uh, carbon dioxide which leaves you vulnerable to things like infections, uh, asthma, heart disease, gastrointestinal problems. Um, also, you'll get uh, a decrease in uh, endorphins. Those are your feel-good hormones, and they will cause an increased cause, um, sensation of pain. So a little bit of pain will actually magnify because of reduced lung capacity. We also see, uh, we also get fatigue and decreased mental performance, especially at work. Right, because we're sitting so long. But when we have to use uh, more metabolic capacity to just hold ourselves upright and using the muscles as opposed to the skeleton, right, we, we fatigue a lot early. It's just common sense. Okay, we'll get pain and muscle tension, stiffness in, in uh, the neck, the jaw, which is called the TMJ. Uh, we'll get shoulder issues, which we'll, we'll see, we'll discuss in a little bit, how if uh, we have a certain posture, we can decrease the range of motion in our shoulder and as well as low back issues. And then <clears throat> there's studies that show that people with what's called a kyphotic posture, kyphosis means just that you're kind of bent forward, right? A, like a forward head posture with rounded shoulders actually shortens your lifespan uh, as opposed to people who have an upright posture. And another study also found that um, children um, will get uh, more ADD and ADHD uh, with improper posture. There was a study that was done that talked about uh, or showed behavioral and productive uh, productivity uh, went up when kids sat on therapy balls as opposed to hardwood and chairs. And then we get hypermobility, right? We, what we say all the time in chiropractic is motion is lotion. So if something is not moving properly, you start to get adhesion buildup and then joints just won't move as, as, as well and they'll start to break down. Oops. Okay. Again, we'll get digestive issues. It'll be another thing because uh, blood circulation will not be uh, going into uh, the intestines. You'll get uh, a compression of uh, the natural motility of the, uh, the food in, uh, called peristaltic peristalsis. And then the TMJ joint, which we discussed a little bit earlier, right? The jaw muscle, right? If the head is in a forward uh, position, it puts strain on uh, the muscles that connect to your jaw. Carpal tunnel syndrome, because the nerves that come out of the neck will go down uh, into the wrist. So usually at C5, C6, we'll see an issue there uh, causing carpal tunnel. And then we get balance and proprioception issues, right? Uh, these are very important, especially as we get older, because uh, the number one uh, problem with uh, elderly is that they, they just don't have the, the body awareness where they are, and they're very susceptible to trips and falls. And decreased lack, uh, decreased in lymphatic drainage. So your lymph is basically like your sewer system. Uh, it's designed to carry away, um, you know, toxins and uh, bacteria, things like that. And if we have a compromised uh, posture, we'll get a decrease in that, and it will get more susceptible to infection. So posture affects and moderates every physiological function. We've discussed many of these, but some other ones would be like hormone production, um, things you, like headaches, mood, okay? And uh, this was uh, discussed in American Journal of Pain Management, all right? And Hans Selye, who is uh, best known for uh, the stress response. 
uh, said that the beginning of all disease processes begin with postural distortions, right? So all this is fascinating, right? <laughs> Why is posture uh, seem to be affecting all this stuff? Well, it's because the your, uh, your spine houses your nervous system, your central nervous system, right? Which consists of your brain, your spinal cord, right? Every medical textbook in the world will tell you that your central nervous system controls and coordinates every function, every organ, every uh, repair system, hormones, is all controlled by your central nervous system. And that's housed by your skull and your, your brain and the 24 movable bones in your spine uh, for the tail of the brain, otherwise known as the spinal cord. And when we have postural distortions, that spinal cord can get interrupted, which we'll see in a moment, okay? So when your bones are not in proper place in the spine, we call that a subluxation, right? A luxation would be like a dislocation, a sub meaning less than, uh, be a minor dislocation, best way to think about it. If we look at the picture on the left, <clears throat> we'll have proper bone alignment. And this little area right here is a spinal nerve, right? Which uh, will come out through the vertebrae and will go to an organ, a muscle or what have you. And when we get a shift in these bones, like we see on this side, we'll get either a herniated disc or we'll get inflammation and the nerve that's coming out here will be interrupted with and will cause dysfunction to wherever it goes. If it goes to your liver, you'll have problems with the liver. If it goes to your heart, your heart may not contract as well. It can cause a host of problems, right? So much so that there was a study done way back in 1921 called the Windsor Autopsy Study. And it was done by Dr. Henry Windsor, who was a medical doctor at the University of Pennsylvania. And what he found was that uh, he looked at 221 structures of cadavers, right, dead people. And he looked at uh, the disease organs and he noticed a 96% correlation between the nerve that came out of the spine and the disease organ, right? So if somebody had heart disease, he traced that uh, nerve back to where the nerve root came out and he, he saw the nerve root was damaged. Right? Same thing with liver and kidney, right? Um, <clears throat> This conclusion was nearly 100% correlation. It was 96%. The other 4%, uh, there was either one nerve root above or below uh, the, the actual nerve root that was um, linked to the organ. Okay. Uh, but the minor distortion in the spinal bones, which caused an irritation to what's called the autonomic or automatic nervous system, right? the, uh, the nervous system that controls the organs, uh, and disease uh, causes disease to the internal organs. Okay, the nerve uh, damage correlation uh, with all 20 cases of heart disease, all 13 cases of liver disease, all nine cases of stomach disease, and 26 cases of lung disease, and eight of prostate and bladder disease, right? So 96% correlation of the exact nerve root, and then 4% was actually one above and one below. And there's a reference right down below if anybody <laughs> cares to, to look it up. So with all this importance and all this... Uh, scientific evidence that we have that the posture really is a window into our health. Uh, it's, it's a shame that most medical doctors don't really take the time to uh, address posture in, uh, in an exam, right? Uh, they're more interested in um, the correlation of disease and how to manage a disease process. But that's where holistic doctors come in, like myself, that uh, we look at more uh, proper function as opposed to a disease process. So what are the most postural, com uh, uh, postural faults, the most common postural faults that we see, right? Uh, these aren't going to be a, uh, an all-inclusive list I, because we'd be here all night. So I just took uh, the most common ones, um, any combination thereof, and we'll look at those, all right? So the, by far, the most common thing we see um, in modern society is forward head posture. Uh, like I said before, the ears should line over the shoulder. And when the ear lines over the shoulder, your neck, we call it the cervical spine, right? Your, which consists of seven bones, forms an arc. Right? It forms an arc because it dissipates the amount of uh, gravitational force that the head pushes down on the body. And as the head moves forward, that cervical spine will straighten out. Okay? For every inch that your head moves forward, you'll gain 10 pounds of weight. Right? So 
you can get a lot of weight. You can get up to you know, 40, 60 pounds of weight on, on the spine because the head is not properly aligned. Right. So here we have this gentleman here, which you can see on the right, it was, it was pretty much good uh, posture. You can see the ear is over the shoulder. And on the left, we can see that that is broken down and we have the forward head posture. Okay, um, so what I would suggest you do is uh, if you can, if you have a friend or you can set up your camera um, just to take a picture of yourself on the side and just look at the picture, right? And then you can just use uh, you know, some kind of a tool on your computer and just draw a line straight down from your ear to your, uh, your ankle and see if everything lines up or not. And if it doesn't, then there's something that you should address, right? Because it's not just a cosmetic issue, although it will make you look older <laughs> with a forward head posture, but it really does have some far reaching um, health consequences that we're not fully aware of yet. All right. So getting back to the forward head posture. Okay. Um, this can be caused by a prolonged um, period of time of looking downward, like uh, looking at texting uh, or looking at a computer or things like that. Um, the faulty position uh, can also be caused by uh, jutting head forward, as in looking at a computer that's not set up properly. In the position, it usually will cause a problem at C3, C4, and that nerve goes to your thyroid. Okay, so if anybody is having thyroid issues, you might want to look at your position of your head, okay? Um, it goes to other places too, other muscles and things like that, but your thyroid is probably the big one, okay? It also show up in uh, areas of T3, T4, which goes to your lungs. <clears throat> and also, as we mentioned earlier, decreased uh, range of motion in the shoulders. So if you're having shoulder issue, it could be coming from that forward head posture, okay? So what does that look like on an X-ray? Okay, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. So. Uh, we're going to discuss this when we talk about how to fix it. The muscles that are tight are going to be uh, your trapezius muscles, which is a muscle on your back that causes your shoulders to shrug. Also, your neck extensors, okay, um, and a muscle called your levator scap. The weak muscles, which I don't think I put here, uh, which would be your neck flexors, okay. So you want to strengthen your neck flexors uh, and uh, strength and stretch the extensors. Oh, there it is, neck flexors. All right, so here's an x-ray of, uh, first one is a normal curve. Here is here, it's a side view, okay? The patient's jawline is here and the back of the head is here. And you can see this beautiful curve here. Think of it like a bridge, okay? So when we have this curve right here, uh, we get a dissipation of the gravitational force. And interestingly enough, all the force when we have a curve like this sits back on these joints right here, okay? These joints are facet joints, which are designed to handle the majority of the weight bearing load of the head. As the head starts to come forward, you'll see in this second uh, x-ray, you get a straightening out of that neck. Now, what happens, interestingly enough, is when the head moves forward, we get a shift in where that weight is distributed. It's no longer on these joints. Now it's starting to shift onto these part of the vertebrae. And these aren't exactly weight bearing. They're more designed for pivot points for movement but now they're gonna to have to take a weight bearing uh, role and these, they're gonna to start to break down and degenerate, which we can see if we go all the way to stage three, we can see how much they've broken down. Um, so we wanna make sure that we bring this back so that the weight bearing is back on here, because again, the bones that are degenerating called arthritis is irreversible, all right? We can also see the discs have, have severely been uh, compromised here in these uh, pictures as well. So we're going to look at uh, the neurological uh, consequence of this on this slide, okay? Because like I said, it's not just cosmetic and it's not just pain because you can, you can take an aspirin and your pain will go away, but that doesn't mean that you're healthy. It just means that you, you don't feel the pain, okay? So here again, side posture uh, of the neck, okay? Whoops, sorry. So the back of the head is here and the jaw is here. So it's facing the opposite way of the last one. And you can see here's that curve on the neck. So this is the x-ray and here's the cadaver. They kind of slice a person in half, right? And here's the vertebrae. The important thing I wanna show you is this right here. This is your spinal cord, right? Think of it as the tail of the brain. This is where all the information that keeps you alive goes through. Right? Everything from your healing response to how much 
hormones produced to your waste product, to your digestion, everything has to come down through here. Now, this right here is called your brainstem. Okay, you can see the brainstem sits above the skull. Your skull is right here and here. When we're curved, we have a slack in the spinal cord and the brain is above the skull. Now, here we have this next uh, cadaver, X-ray. You can see we're starting to get a straightening out of uh, the neck. And if we look at the cadaver study, as we get that straightening out of the neck, we can see here again is the brain stem and here is a skull. You can see how much farther down the skull it is. Right, skull's right here, skull's right here, brain stem is here versus here, so much more room, right? That brain stem is responsible for all the autonomic function, heart rate, respiration, things like that, okay? And now it's getting pulled down and getting squeezed upon and it's compromising uh, the normal autonomic function of the body. If we look at the front view, it's even more dramatic, right? On the uh, left side is a normal neck. Here is the skull right here. And you can see the brain stem is way above the skull. On a straight neck right here, here's the skull right here. Here's the skull right here. Look at where the brain stem is. It's below the skull. It's good to look at uh, this um, landmark right here, uh, this vascular structure. You can see it kind of forms like a fork. Here it is over here versus the brain. It's about even with the skull on this view and it's well below on this view. So we're putting a lot of stress on our autonomic nervous system or our, you know, our master control system of the body, right? So we got a lot of problems that can be caused from this forward head posture, All right? So <clears throat> rarely do things happen in a vacuum, right? That forward head posture is not uh, gonna happen all by itself 99% of the time because the body wants to try and correct or try and hold the body upright. Right? If, you, if you just have a forward head posture, you're more likely to cause a, a center of gravity be shifted in front of the body and you don't want to tip over. So it's going to, your body has to shift its weight. So we're going to get what's called an upper cross syndrome. Upper cross syndrome be, uh, being that the shoulders will start to round, which we can see here, right? Let me go on the next slide. It's probably easier to see, right? Here's our upper cross syndrome. <clears throat> so what we're going to get, why it's called upper cross syndrome is because we have tightness, back here, tightness down here, and then weakness up here and weakness down here. So we're gonna get a um, rounding of the shoulders, okay? And we're gonna get a tightness of the pectoral muscles right here, which we're gonna show you how to fix those later. And you're gonna tightness of the suboccipitals, right? The extensors of the neck, as well as the upper traps, the muscles that shrug your shoulders up and down. Then you get a weakness of cervical flexors and a weakness of it's called your rhomboids or the muscles that cause your shoulder blades to pull back towards each other and the lower traps. All right. Which we just discussed all that. So you've got a chronic um, subluxation or misalignment of the bone at C5, C6, uh, usually with an upper cross syndrome. And that's something that, that the chiropractor should, uh, should address. Also C4, C5 is common with that as well. Okay, next we look at what's called a sway back. Okay, this is, uh, we're now moving towards a lower body. So a sway back looks like they're protruding uh, forward their, their belly, okay? Again, your body is now shifted, the center of gravity is shifted in front. So your body wants to try and compensate with that. So it'll cause a sway back. We'll get a sway back when we have a uh, pelvic tilting forward and the hips press forward and, uh, and sit in front of the ribs, right? So when we get that, try and put that line down, right? The shoulders are behind uh, the hips or where they should be. We'll get an excessive curve in the, in the low back. We call that a uh, hyperlordosis right back here, okay? But sometimes we don't see that uh, hyperlordosis. It's kind of hidden because a person will bend or flex at the hips and they'll kind of bend a little bit forward. So this will look a little bit flatter. Okay. And we'll get uh, weak hip flexors, uh, low, um, lower abdominals and mid back muscles will all be weak. And then we've got tight hamstrings. And that's what it's gonna look like, right? Weak abdominals, which would be here and weak glutes here. So we'll get that X again and tight 
um, thoracolumbar extensors and tight hip flexors. Okay, and this will create a, uh, a problem in the lumbars at L4, L5 and L5, S1, right, which is a really common area for disc herniations. <clears throat> so what can cause these, right? Everybody always wants to know, how did I get this? How did it happen? Well, it, it's lifestyle, right? It's 100% it's lifestyle. Nobody's born with postural distortions. Um, so the first thing we look at is uh, repetitive use injuries, right? The things that you don't really realize can cause a problem <clears throat> that we do thousands, thousands of times, most commonly like uh, either texting or typing or using a mouse, right? We use a mouse, we click it thousands of times a day. It's just a slight motion, but it's done over and over again. We get micro contractions of the upper trap, which is in the neck area or the arm on one side. Right, magnified times a thousand, you can you can see the the amount of, of force that's going on one side, and then you're going to muscle and bounce from one side versus the other. Okay, we also get micro traumas, right? Little trips, little falls, bumps, things like that. All this stuff tends to build up. Then our poor lifestyle habits, like looking down when we're texting. We mentioned earlier, for every uh, inch forward the head goes, we gain ten pounds uh, of uh, of weight on the head. You know, kids are are notorious for playing games on their computer with their, uh, on their phones or texting with their head down for hours at a time, right? We're remolding the spine to be in a suboptimal position, which is gonna cause degeneration. Okay. You know, jutting our head forward uh, for prolonged periods of time while um, looking at a computer screen, okay? Most people don't have their computers set up properly. Uh, I'm gonna go over that in, uh, in a few moments and how to properly set that up. Right. And your body can withstand about 20 minutes uh, of uh, static posture in, in a stress situation before it starts to break down. So if you're set up in a position like this guy here for more than 20 minutes, you're starting to cause damage and degeneration to the discs, uh, to the soft tissue structures, and eventually to the bones. Okay. Reading with our head down or jutted forward and poor sleeping patterns. And we're going to go over uh, how to sleep, uh, what the proper way to sleep is in a moment, okay. And then the most common one is uh, sitting in front of a TV on a couch, right? With a, with a curved back. Okay, so ergonomic considerations. Ergonomic just means kind of, um, you know, uh, our, our environment, right? So first thing you wanna do is identify your risk, uh, your risk factors, right? We talked already about uh, the repetition, right? how much force is placed on the body, right? Uh, we talk a lot about work because that's where most people spend the majority of their time is either sleeping or working. Right? Um, what kind of awkward positions are we? Are we leaning on one side versus the other, right? Or do we have a bag over one, one shoulder versus the other? Okay. How long do we stay in a static uh, posture, right? Are we sitting at a desk for four or five hours at a time without movement, right? Um, what kind of contact stress we have? Are we typing on a, on a keyboard and uh, we're compressing our wrists, which is uh, causing nerve interference at that point. And then we look at psychosocial issues, right? Because um, there's a thing called fight or flight, where if we're constantly in a state of stress, we're gonna release certain, uh, certain hormones that are gonna be detrimental to our health as well and cause increased in things like um, you know, a pain tolerance and whatnot. Okay, so what can you do, right? Well. When we talk about smartphones or uh, iPads, things like that, you can bring it up to eye level, right? Bring your elbows in towards your body, right? Uh, have it uh, supporting you so you're not looking down, right? Uh, when talking on the phone, hold your phone to your ear instead of bending, bending your head to the side. If you're gonna be on the phone for a long period of time, you use a, a headset, right? And a microphone, um, that'll save you a lot of time. So when we're looking at our monitor, right? Your monitor should be about arm's length away, right? Anything more than that or less than that will uh, cause eye strain if you're looking at it for long periods of time. So about 15 to, uh, 15 to 32 inches away. Okay. The top of the monitor should be about eye level so that your head is not uh, in, a, in a forward flex position, which is gonna cause problems with the neck. And then, when we talk about healthy sitting, uh, you want to choose a chair that allows you to rest both your feet on the floor. If your chair doesn't allow that, 
you can get some kind of a, uh, like a, a little um, stool or something like that. And you wanna make sure you're sitting back in a chair so you have lumbar support, right? Uh, so you can keep that curve in the low back. You want a 90 degree angle in the hips and also 90 degrees in the knees. Your knees should not be up against the bottom of the chair, right? Cause that can cause a uh, compression of the nerves behind the knee. You should have about an inch or two uh, space between your knee and the chair. Okay. Your elbows should be uh, flexed at about 90 degrees. Okay. Which will allow a uh, neutral wrist uh, when you're typing, right? Far too many people, what they do is um, they have a, they're not exactly set up. So they have to reach, right? This arm is not flush with the body. The arm is flexed. So it's in front of the body. What that's going to do is it's going to cause a rounding of the shoulders and the shoulders are going to round and then it's going to cause the head to jut forward. And it's probably one of the most common things we see when right? people use laptops all the time. Um, if you're using a laptop for work, you really should get uh, either one or two things, either an external monitor or what would be easier to do would just be an external keyboard and then put your uh, computer up uh, at eye level. So this way you're not reaching forward and rounding your shoulders and causing that forward head posture. And we kind of discussed this already. Uh, you want to um, make sure your hips are uh, rounded forward. Okay. I use one of these a lot. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, it's a stability disc. You can sit on this. It's not probably not a good idea to sit on it the entire time because it does take a little bit of work to sit on it. Uh, but you can sit on it for 10 minutes, an hour, 15 minutes, an hour, which will cause you to engage your postural muscles uh, and uh, kind of keep you from slouching. <clears throat> Okay. which is what we just discussed, right? Uh, your, inner, uh, your inner core uh, muscles will be will keep you upright with, with the stability disc. And the other thing we want to discuss, uh, mainly for men, right? You want to make sure you're not sitting on a wallet, right? Um, because you can see what happened, right? You sit on a wallet and it's going to cause a spinal distortion. The other thing it's going to do is going to compress your sciatic nerve and which cause issues um, to that area running down the leg. All right, so just very easy fix. Take your wallet out, put it in your front pocket when you're sitting. Okay, so our workstations. The other couple of uh, things we wanna um, keep an eye on, right? You wanna adjust uh, things that you're reaching for. You wanna have to uh, reach excessively like for staplers or things like that. Keep everything within arm's distance. Uh, adjust your focal requirements. We talked about that with the, the monitor. It should be between 15 and 32 inches. And take micro breaks about once an hour, right? So when we talk about uh, where we, we're at, with, uh, when the posture breaks down at a workstation, right, at, at a desk, everything's kind of in a flex position, right? Your pecs are tight, your shoulders are rounded, your head's forward. So you kind of want to do the opposite, and open everything up. You want to stretch everything from the front. Um, I have a, uh, I call it desk exercise, right? A little um, kind of two, three minutes exercise to do um, that people keep near their desk to do once an hour. You don't even have to get out of your chair to do it just to stretch a certain thing. If anybody's interested in that, just uh, drop me an email and I will get that out to you. Okay. Uh, my email is going to be at the end. All right. My contact information. So if you just drop me an email, I'll, I'll send that to you uh, probably tomorrow. Okay. So proper way to sleep, right? Um, it's another common question I get. So you want to uh, avoid bending or twisting, right? Especially your neck. So you want to find a pillow that is about the size, the size between the shoulder and the ear. I always tell people that before you're going to go invest in an expensive uh, pillow, go in your bathroom and get some bath towels, right? Get about probably three bath towels and start with bath towels because they're soft enough where uh, it'll provide enough comfort and you can layer them to whatever thickness you want and play around with that. It'll take you maybe a week to figure out what height is comfortable for you. Right, so you just fold it again, unfold it until you find it, find something that's gonna be comfortable for you. You want to be like this top person right here, right? The neck in neutral position. You don't want the, the neck to be strained because it's a long time to keep the neck in an awkward position. And essentially what you're doing is you're training your body to be in a um, state of pathology, right? Uh, your body is gonna adapt to whatever state you put it in. And if you put it in a, in a stressful state for an extended period of time, it's gonna to adapt to that, all right? So we want a straight spine as much as possible. I tell people lie on your side, okay? Um, you should 
there's yeah two different ways to look at it, right? Uh, you should lie primarily with the left side down because what happens is your stomach has a bowl and the bowl is on the left side. And if you lie right side down, stomach acids can start to drip and leak into the small intestine, which could cause irritation um, to wake you up. That being said, if you have liver issues, right? So a lot of people have fatty liver issues. Um, you lying on the right side, your heart tends to shift a little bit onto your liver, which can cause distress that way. Uh, if anybody does have a liver issue, again, drop me an email. Um, I have a, a book, um, an ebook that I'll send you on how to, how to clear that up, all right? It's very easy to do. It just takes a little bit of time and effort on your part, but um, it's very cheap and easy to do. And your liver is probably one of the most important organs that you can uh, keep functioning well because it's responsible for getting rid of all the toxins and it makes a lot of hormones as well. All right. <clears throat> okay. So the other thing you want to do is you want to put a pillow or some kind of uh, towel between your knees, because if you don't, what's going to happen is your upper leg is going to roll forward and it's going to roll your pelvis and your pelvis rolling forward is going to cause a tension on your whole spine. Your spine is protected in something called dura, uh, right? Uh, women know this when they really get when they're pregnant because they get an epidural, right? The dura is a protective uh, membrane around the spinal cord. Now, if your pelvis rolls forward, think of it like a towel that's, that's wringing out. The entire towel, right, will cause tension and shortness. Now you roll your pelvis forward, same thing. Your whole spinal cord will start to put, be under tension. So put something between your knees so you can keep it in a neutral position. Okay, next. All right. Your mattress should be firm, but not too firm. It should be comfortable um, enough, but uh, not too soft that you sink in it and you, know, you can't maintain a good spine. All right. All right. We already kind of went over this, right? I tend to just talk and I don't read my slides too, uh, too, too much, but there they are for uh, if you miss what I said. Uh, if anybody wants me to read off the slide, just let me know. I just kind of kind of wing it. All right. Uh, surprisingly enough, this uh, this is something that I didn't th really think I had discussed. But uh, when, when I noticed people trying to get off my chiropractic table, uh, they always get off the wrong way. <laughs> so when you think about getting up, right, you want to use your body like a pendulum, right? Your hips are the uh, the, the center uh, the center point, and as you drop your legs down, you lift your upper body up, right? And it should swing kind of like a teeter totter or a seesaw, right? So. Getting out of bed, especially because your body is not warmed up and it's, it's been resting for eight, nine hours, um, you wanna make sure you take care, especially if you have a low back problem. So you roll to your side, bend your hips and your knees to like a 90 degree angle. And then you're gonna, as you bring your legs, your feet off the edge of the bed, you're gonna push up with the, uh, the upper part of the arm. So again, you're gonna, the feet create kind of like a counterweight and the arm's going to push up. So you kind of in one smooth motion, will get up to a seated position, right? You do not want to flex your hips and get up from uh, lying on your back position because that's going to engage something called your hip flexors, which will pull on your discs. And anybody who has low back issues probably has compromised discs and you don't want to put too much stress on those. All right. Uh... Okay, um, along the lines of ergonomics, we wanna talk about uh, making sure that we are not bending forward. So this young lady on the left, when she bends forward, right? We have the hips, what's called a fulcrum, uh, right? Or uh, a pivot point, right? And the upper body now is causing so much pressure on her low back because it has to hold that up, right? It's much, much better for the body just, just to drop down to one knee so you can keep a neutral posture. So we talked earlier about uh, uh, performance posture breaks, right? Uh, reverse the pressure of gravity by going into anterior gravity. So we're going to go into extension. And again, uh, I have uh, five or six exercises, I guess. It takes like maybe three to five minutes or something like that uh, to do once an hour, right? Another little trick is just drink a lot of water because you'll, it'll force you to get up and go to the bathroom once an hour or so. Right, we don't want to stay in that static posture. And every time I mention this to people, they always tell me the same thing. Well, I'm so busy at work. I really, I don't even have that much time. I can't even take the two minute break. And it, studies have proven that 
taking micro breaks, number one, will prevent you from missing sick days, uh, work days from being sick, right? And being out uh, with, we have workers comp in America. I'm not sure if they have the same thing here, but being missing work because, because of pain. Number two, uh, you, you'll have much more clarity of thought because your spine is a generator for your brain. And when it's not moving, it's not sending any signal to your brain and it'll shut down your brain. I always give the example of if you've ever been on a long car ride, even if you're not driving, when you get tired, you, you shouldn't get tired because you're sitting, right? You're sitting doing nothing. You're sitting in a chair, right? But you get tired because there's no stimulation to the brain from movement, right? Now, if you take another day and you get up and you go for a, a little run in the morning, you have energy throughout the day, even though you've ex expended far more energy than that car ride. But you sent a lot of information to the brain from the spine, right? So the brain has started to, to wake up, right? So same thing, right? If you get up and just move around two, three minutes, once an hour, it's going to wake your brain up and you're going to be much more creative, much more productive. Okay. Um, all right. So when you, uh, you do a stretch, you should hold it for about 30 seconds, right? Uh, which uh, most people know. Okay. And then we do it once, once an hour. All right, so this is the part everybody's waiting for, right? How to correct. Okay, so we talk about posture correction, right? There's two things we wanna uh, take, take into account, right? Stability and flexibility, right? That's kind of the meat and potatoes of uh, any kind of home posture care. Uh, I probably should, uh, probably should have said this at the beginning, but this is for information uh, and educational purposes, right? Um, I don't uh, try and diagnose anybody here saying that, you know, there's kind of one, one shoe that fits every, every foot, right? Every person is different and uh, every person is going to have slightly different needs. So it is probably best to get assessed properly by a uh, regular medical, uh, probably trained medical uh, personnel, uh, chiropractor, medical doctor, physical therapist, something like that, right? Uh, but this is just to give you guys an idea and to help give you some tools that you can, you can take home with you. So that being said, right, uh, stability and flexibility, right? Some joints we need flexibility on and some joints we need stability on, right? So the thing to, uh, to keep in mind is uh, it can take up to 12 weeks to, dis to develop um, you know, spinal and core musculature, right? So it's important that you don't get discouraged, right? 12 weeks, three months, right? Uh, so stick with it for three months. Uh, trust me, nobody's ever come out of the 12 weeks and said, oh, I'm, I wasted my time, <laughs> right? You'd just be sorry that you didn't start it sooner. That's the, the only complaint you're gonna have. So it's important that you don't skip or miss days because studies have shown that just missing two days in a row, especially in the beginning, cause a, a loss of progress up to 50%. And missing three days in a row can be up to 90% because people usually just, just stop. So just find a time that you can do it, right? In the morning, in the evening, just the same time. Usually best we pick the same time every day so that it gets part of a routine, right? And then just commit to it, all right? So we're gonna just address spinal alignment, uh, range of motion and um, strength and flexibility, right? So there are two types of muscle systems that we're gonna look at. Uh, one is called the tonic phase, right? Those are tonic being tight, right, tone. And then the other is the phasic system, which are prone to weakness, right? These are the ones that are, that are gonna need stability. Right. If you look at uh, all the muscles on the right, our phasic system, these uh, muscles, they're not necessarily muscles that you think of uh, that do work. Right. They're more muscles uh, that are, are there to, to hold the joint in place. Right. Our middle and lower traps, as well as our rhomboids, hold our scapula or our shoulder blade in place so that the arm can move and have a stable base. Right. Um, same thing with uh, the transverse abdominis here, right? It's not, a, it doesn't do any movement. So the exercise that we're gonna do for this, there's gonna be no movement involved. We're creating a neuromuscular um, connection, uh, I should say, right? And then on the other side, our tight muscles, right? Our, um, these are, we're gonna stretch these, just very simply stretch them, okay? Um, and like I said before, uh, this isn't a uh, all-inclusive list and some people won't have, muscles that are tight on one side or weak on the other side. So um, you have to kind of kind of play around with it and see, see where you fit. Okay, so 
This I put in here because when we think of muscles, right, it, it's best to think of muscles like a seesaw. Uh, they have to work together, right? Um, think of your arm. If you're going to flex your arm and extend your arm, if I flex my arm, right, my bicep has to flex my arm. Now, in order for my bicep to flex my arm, my tricep has to release. If my tricep's in a spasm, it, I can't flex my arm, right? So just like this fat kid on, on the one side of the seesaw, he's not gonna let go, so the other kid can't come down, right? So you, you get, if you get a spasm muscle, right, tight muscle, something like that, it's gonna make it impossible for this muscle to do its job, right? If you get a muscle that is too strong on one side, it's gonna shut down a muscle uh, on the other side. And then you're gonna have compensatory muscles trying to take over, and that becomes a big problem because um, muscles that aren't designed to do a workload, we're gonna have to do a workload and it's gonna throw your, uh, your posture off and uh, cause a whole bunch of problems. All right, so the three intrinsic systems that we're looking at are, are neuromuscular, right? Uh, neuro being uh, brain, spinal cord, our nervous system, our biomechanical, our, our form that we're gonna use and our physiological, right? The muscles that, that we're gonna contract. All right. <clears throat> the key areas are, are going to be uh, looking at proprioception. Proprioception just means um, aware of the body right, uh, in space, right? And there's, uh, there's a couple areas that the body has uh, a little bit uh, more proprioception or um, information that's going to tell the brain where it is in space. Uh, so you want to pay a little extra attention to those. And those are the soles of the feet. So whenever you're doing any exercise, it, if possible, if you're doing it at home, best to do it in bare feet because it's a ton of information that's sending to um, your brain. Your SI joint or your hip joints, um, so uh, it's misleading when I say hip. So not the joint that where the, uh, the leg bone goes into your pelvis, uh, the joint in um, kind of where the dimples are on the back of your, uh, your pelvis, right? those joints there. And then also the cervical spine, the, the neck, right? There's a ton of proprioceptors in, in the neck. So we're going to pay special attention to that as well. Okay. So the other thing to take note is, right, um, we're doing a neuromuscular uh, re-education here, a neuromuscular um, activity. So you do not need to go to maximum strength, right? It's not like um, a bodybuilder, right? A bodybuilder wants to uh, create something called hypertrophy, right? Wants the muscle to get big so you, so the, you look like a big Arnold Schwarzenegger. You only need about 25% of your maximum uh, contraction to provide uh, enough um, growth and enough development of the muscle. And even as little as 1% to 3% uh, is required in the lumbar spine. So don't go to absolute failure, right? We're trying to create a neuromuscular pathway, right? We're trying to get the brain to contract the muscle over and over and over again until it becomes habit. Right. Uh, so as we talked about earlier, right, you're going to get compensatory movements uh, if certain muscles aren't, uh, aren't able to do their job. Uh, classic example, if we have our hamstrings, right, hamstrings are usually very tight because people spend time sitting, so they're very tight. So what they're going to do is they're going to shut off your glutes, your, your butt muscles. Your butt muscles are extremely important for moving, for walking. Now, if your butt muscles aren't doing their job, they're gonna, you're gonna need a compensatory muscle, which is gonna be your low back. And so you're gonna use your hamstring low back as opposed to your butt muscle to, to walk, which is gonna create problems and gonna give you low back pain. So we're gonna have to try and renormalize these things and uh, do what's called neuromuscular re-education, which is ingrained in the motor cortex as we see here. Okay, so we always start mobility first, right? Um, Mobility, then stability, okay? So Dr. Roger Sperry uh, won a Nobel Prize. Uh, he stated that movement of the joints of the spine is analogous to a windmill generating electricity to run on a power plant. Therefore, the more mechanical distorted a person becomes, the less energy is for healing metabolism and thinking, all right? Kind of what we said about earlier about the example about sitting in a car versus going for a walk, right? Motion is lotion. And the body needs movement for energy, right? For information, for function. So we're gonna start, uh, this is uh, one of those muscles that we saw with the upper cross syndrome, right? We're gonna look at 
Hey, don't, don't worry about writing all these down. If anybody wants these, I'll give you the exercises. No problem. Just drop me an email again. Emails will be at the end. Drop me an email and I will send all these exercises to, to you. So you don't have to worry about writing all these down or trying to remember them. Okay. Uh, but we're going to look at a trap, trap stretch, right? I'm going to go over these very quickly. Cause again, if you guys want these, uh, I'll send them to you. Okay. So you want to stretch your trap. Your trap is a muscle right here, right? Upper back of the neck, because we're sitting uh, forward uh, posture. These get very tight. Anytime you do a stretch, you're going to do what's called a static stretch for the most part. Static stretches slowly go until you feel a tug on the muscle, hold it for about 30 seconds. You do not want to do what's called a ballistic stretch, which is that bouncing type stretch that tends to uh, cause injury. Right? The only time you would do that is uh, in um, some specific athletic competitions, right? but a static stretch. There's also a type of stretch, which I put in here called a PNF stretch. It stands for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Um, it's a more effective way to stretch. Uh, it's a little bit, the learning curve on it is a little bit, uh, a little bit steeper, but uh, we'll go over that when we get to that page. Okay. Next muscle is called your levator scap. Okay. It's a, a kind of, it's along there with the trap. It's attached to the scapula and the neck, right? When these muscles get tight, they cause headaches. They cause that forward head posture right? and they cause shoulder issues. Right? And that's how to stretch it. And again, I'm happy to give these to anybody who wants them. Okay, next thing we want to do is create that head retraction. Okay, we want to make sure that the ear is over the shoulder so we can reestablish that nice, beautiful curve in the neck that's going to provide weight bearing for the head. Okay, and then uh, when we look at that upper cross syndrome, if that's something that you feel like you may have, you want to stretch the pecs, right? Which you can just find a doorway or corner of any, uh, any room and you go to 90 degree angle on your arms and you take a step forward and hold that for 30 seconds. Okay, one of the biggest things I see that people have problems is they get a lot of tightness and stiffness in their upper back. When they have that upper cross syndrome, their shoulders are rounded and their pecs are tight. And then their back starts because there's lack of motion there. You'll start to get adhesions in the upper back here, right? We, we always see like, old people, right? They're always stooped forward in that position, right? This is very detrimental to your health. So it's a, it's a key area that we want to get mobility in. So I put a couple of different examples in here. So in the prayer stretch, right? We're stretching our lats, which is the back muscle, right? That, that gives you that V if you look at the thing about bodybuilders, right? And also it's going to help get a little bit of mobility to this area called your thoracic spine. If this is a little bit too easy for you, Okay. You can take it to the next level by getting an exercise ball. So you can get a little bit deeper in that stretch on the back muscle, right? Um, you can also use a, a foam roller as well, right? Uh, they work very well and they're, they're very versatile. Okay. And here's another way to do it. You can just kind of reverse it and go into an extension. This doesn't stretch the lats, but it, it gives mobility to the thoracic spine. Okay. Again, Thoracic spine mobility is, is very important here. We're going to do this called um, the different names for it cat camel, we'll put mid back uh, quadruped. Right? What you're going to do is as you breathe in, you're going to round your back like an angry uh, cat or camel, I'm sorry, <laughs> round your back like a camel. And then as you exhale, you're going to push this part of your body, your thoracic, all the way down and try and create a little arch in your low back. And you're gonna do this back and forth, back and forth, okay? We do with kind of flossing of the back, getting mobility in that mid back, right? Very rarely do people actually spend time trying to get mobility in this area. And again, you get no mobility, you get things that are gonna to start to create adhesions. Um, anybody who's ever broken a, a limb and been in a cast knows that when you get the cast off, you can't even move your, your limb anymore. The joint, the joint is, is pretty much stuck. You have to go to rehab to, to get that joint moving again. Because after six weeks, you've created a bunch of adhesions that, and the, the body's starting to fuse that joint together. So we definitely don't want that. So we need to break that up. Okay, now, as we talked about that forward head posture, you're gonna go into a um, muscle uh, isometric contraction of um, the neck flexors. So you're gonna just put your hand back in the head. You can use a towel also. Right. You can even use a TheraBand or something like that. 
And again, we don't need maximum contraction. We need right, 25% at best, right? And you're gonna hold it for about 10 seconds, right? Which will help uh, strengthen the, the neck flexors and put that head back in a neutral position. Okay, we get to the lower body. The areas that we wanna stretch and, and concentrate on are our hamstrings, okay? And you can do uh, either just a, a seated hamstring stretch, okay? Here we get into what's called that PNF stretch we talked about. Now, PNF stretch, um, most of the PNF stretches, you're going to need a, a, a partner or a trainer or something. Some of them you can do on your own, but for the most part, uh, you're going to need a trainer. So the concept of PNF stretch is that a muscle has a physiological response of relaxing right after a contraction. So we can take advantage of that by contracting a muscle for about 10 seconds. And again, take into that uh, consideration that law before, right? We don't need maximum contraction. 25% contraction is more than enough. So in this picture, this young lady is contracting her hamstring. She's trying to pull her heel down to the ground with about 25% of her force. And this gentleman is resisting that. And then as she relaxes after 10 seconds, this hamstring will let go. And the hamstring will just relax and she can get a deeper stretch. And you can do that about three times. Well, if we go back to the example of the pec stretch, right? We uh, see that you can do that on your own, right? Uh, you can try and bring your elbows close together as the wall is holding them apart. And after 10 seconds, you relax, you can, you'll notice you can get a deeper stretch, okay? So hip flexor stretch, extremely important, right? Because everybody's got hip flexors these days. Now, when we do a hip flexor stretch, you're stretching this back leg, the leg on the knee. We want to make sure that we don't arch this back. We protect our back and keep it nice and safe. Okay. Uh, and then we go forward. This one you can do a PNF on too as you come forward. You can try and contract that, try and bring this knee forward, 25% of strength, relax, and you'll be able to go deeper into that stretch. Okay. A sideline quad stretch. I like a sideline quad stretch because uh, you can protect your low back as well. And when you do that, it's important to bring the opposite knee up so that we don't get excess of rounding in the low back and stretch this. You're going to bring the heel to the buttock and then push this knee back of that away. Piriformis stretch. This is important, uh, especially with people who have sciatica. Okay. Uh, and it's just, I, I'd like to see this woman bring her knee a little bit more towards the opposite shoulder here. Uh, and then you're going to make sure this, you're bringing your foot towards the ear, right? You're twisting it because piriformis is an external rotator. So now we want to rotate that hip. Okay, now we're getting into some strengthening exercises. So the first one we talked about is the transverse abdominis. It's probably the most important uh, exercise you can do for low back pain, all right? Uh, or lower cross syndrome or any of those. Now we talked about uh, stability muscles, right? Your transverse abdominis, which we see over here, is not a movement muscle, it's a stability muscle. So there's no movement involved in this exercise, right? We're just creating a brain to body connection, right? We're trying to create that pathway. Just like if you were thinking about a field, right? Walking across that field, you walk across once, you see a little pathway. You walk back and forth a hundred times, that pathway gets more and more ingrained and easier to see. Same thing here. So you're gonna start lying on your back, bend your knees, right? I have a whole video on this, but it's so important that I give it to so many people. Um, and again, anything you guys need on this, just, just drop me an email and I'll, I'll send you whatever. Uh, just write it down and then just drop me an email. Uh, but you sit on your back, and you're going to create a contraction of this transverse abdominis, which is no movement, right? The rectus abdominis is what everybody likes, which is right here, okay? Rectus abdominis is where you do your crunches, but we're not doing that now. We're, we're doing this one. You can see transverse abdominis looks like a belt, right? So that's what we want to do for stability purposes. You're going to, uh, best way to do it is with the Kegel exercise. Kegel, um, the way to describe a Kegel is if you are urinating um, and you stop midstream, right? You're going to use those pelvic floor muscles to contract. When you contract uh, those pelvic floor muscles, your transverse abdominis also contracts. You can also contract it uh, with um, breathing exercises, also planking, things like that. Uh, but this is the easiest level to do it. And after that, we go to our crunches, which is, is the, uh, the rectus abdominis, okay? This uh, will prevent that, um, that forward shift of the pelvis, okay? Uh, this bridge is for the glutes, right? For, so we want to make sure we engage the glutes because if the glutes are not engaging, we're going to get too much engagement in the low back muscles, which are going to cause low back pain and cause disc issues in L4, L5 and L5, S1. 
So uh, this is level one bridge exercise. Okay, we can step up to level two by extending a leg. Right? We want to put ourselves in positions that cause uh, the body to be unstable, right? Because you, everything we're working on here is stability. Right? We're not working on actual strength, right? Because if you, you usually you have enough strength, it's just you don't have uh, the, the functional strength, right? Which is stability. Okay, but to have a one-time push, most people have enough strength unless you were bedridden or something like that. So we want to put our bodies in positions that uh, that cause it to to be more uh, unstable. You can take this even a step further by taking that stability disc that I showed you earlier and putting it under this opposite foot, make an unstable environment. Right now, you're going to have to use use your body to hold yourself up. Okay. Um, and then this is going to go from easiest, just extend uh, one leg or one arm, right? It's going to cause transverse abdominis, low back stability, glutes, all the stabilization exercises as well. Okay? Make it a little harder by extending leg and opposite arm. Okay. And so that pretty much, if you do that, that should cover like 90% of people's uh, aches and pains. And, and bring you back into uh, much a little bit more of a functional state. Uh, I want to take a little bit of a moment and talk about whole body vibration, right? A lot of people just say, well, I don't want to do all this stuff. That's too much, <laughs> right? Uh, my health doesn't matter that much to me. Um, you can get a whole, by, whole um, full body workout with, a, uh, with body vibration, right? Body vibration is uh, something that's going to cause a uh, vibration of the muscles which cause them to contract like the entire body okay and it's going to help with muscle strength uh, tone and endurance okay it'll increase um, blood and lymph circulation which we mentioned earlier so it can be a problem okay you decrease inflammation because you're increasing circulation decrease pain uh, and mobilize joints reduce stress uh, and regenerate tissues okay and it'll decrease scar tissue as well help break that down and um, especially like in, in your spine. It'll help prevent osteoporosis and reverse, uh, reverse some of it because the vibration creates a stress which the body's gonna respond to that stress by laying down more bone. Okay. It'll improve posture by working on those postural muscles. Uh, it'll improve balance, improve proprioception, which is again, uh, awareness where we are in space and at neuromuscular re-education, right? That is so important if we've been having these faulty uh, movement patterns, we, we really have to re-educate the body. Otherwise, you just, you kind of stick bailing out a sinking ship. You're just going to go right back to the old, um, the old pattern. And it'll decrease your stress hormone and increase your growth hormone, uh, which will improve um, healing and, and function. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so just standing on a vibe, a vibe plate, because your body as uh, posture muscle contract 30 to 50 times per second, right? Because it's, it's just, it's a high vibrational frequency and the body just contract. So you get a flood of uh, neuromuscular response from a whole body vibration. Uh, so you can just get a full body workout in eight to 10 minutes, right? You can complete an entire workout as opposed to, you know, going to the gym or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> And vibration training uh, can increase muscle strength by 20 to 30% more than conventional strength training while cutting training time dramatic, uh, dramatically. The uh, vibration uh, effectively increases the force placed on muscle fibers by a factor of 3G. G just being, means gravity, or three times the force of gravity, right? So it's a, it's a unique type of uh, exercise that you can't, uh, you can't uh, mimic in, in, other, in the gym unless you had a specific vibration machine. So the vibration frequency that you want is somewhere between 20 to 50 Hertz or 1200 to 3000 uh, RPMs, okay? So if you're gonna go out and buy one, you wanna look for, for those, um, those specs. <clears throat> okay, it's also gonna stimulate the cerebellum. Cerebellum is um, the, uh, the part of the brain that's responsible for movement. It's also part of the brain that's responsible for, uh, for move, um, you know, uh, coordination of thought as well. Uh, and it's gonna increase uh, change in neuroplasticity of your nervous system. All right. Uh, okay, uh, one thing I just kind of stuck in here, it's, uh, it's a good thing to note, is that your eye uh, 
has a lot to do with, uh, with the posture, your postural muscles, right? Because your body has what's called a writing reflex. So it's always going to try and keep itself upright. So uh, studies have shown that the, the medial rectus muscle in the eye uh, has a relationship to, uh, to the erector group, right? The multifidus muscles, right? Those are the, the muscles that hold your spine in place. So what you can do is you can get, uh, you can get some eyeglasses, right? That have um, specific uh, lights that'll stimulate uh, that medial rectus muscle. And then you get a lens, a yellow tends to generate energy of muscles uh, and strengthening nerves and aiding in the brain to you. So eye lights look like this, right? And they have little lights here, 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 and here on both sides. And they'll cause a stimulation of wherever you program it. And it, if you use those while you're like on a vibe plate, right? Now you're getting, you know, uh, you just increased your workout efficiency, you know, by a, a factor of, I don't know, <laughs> but, but you just increased your, uh, your efficiency of your, of your workout, right? Our key here is the reason why I put it in is to just stress that, right? We're concerned with the neuromuscular component of it, right? If the brain is not causing the body to function, the body won't function. You can't just kind of aimlessly go about and just do a bunch of exercises. We have to get the neurological component involved in it, all right? And then this is, I'm gonna go through this quickly because I'm already a little bit over time. Uh, I just have, I put this on almost every uh, lecture I have because it's, it's so useful, right? A proven benefits of a 30 minute brisk walk a day, not a run, not a marathon, just a 30 minute brisk walk a day. You see there's so, there's, I got, there's three complete slides of it, right? Uh, it bends up to 91% of case two diabetes, uh, okay. prevents up to 50% of all cases of heart disease, right? Just again, 30 minute walk, 50% case of, if I told you that I had a drug that would knock your uh, heart disease, uh, chances down by 50%, uh, everybody would be lining up around the corner to take it 30 minute walk. It's free, right? Reduce the risk of stroke by 25 to 30%. Okay, prevent up to 50% of all stroke deaths, reduce uh, congestive heart failure deaths by 63%, reduce hospital remissions uh, for heart failure, 71%, normalizes blood pressure. And by the way, all this I, I've got, I pulled out of uh, a, a research material. So it's, I'm not making this stuff up. This is all you know, documented research, uh, proven fact. Uh, reduce the risk of developing high blood pressure. Uh, restore and maintain heart and blood vessel health and increase the HDL, which is what's, I, I hate this term, but I'm gonna use it anyway. Uh, the good cholesterol, uh, as opposed to the LDL, which is typically known as the bad cholesterol. Although there's no such thing as good and bad cholesterol. You need them both. And there, there, there's a reason for them. <clears throat> Decreases the LDL cholesterol or triglycerides. Just a, a quick side note, because it's, it's worth uh, talking about. The LDL, the, what's called the bad cholesterol, it's not bad at all. You need it, right? The LDL, the reason why people have high LDLs is because they have uh, little micro tears in their, their vascular system. And LDL acts kind of like a cement in your vascular system. It plugs up the holes that, that's causing problems. So un unfortunately, it's gotten all convoluted. And where medical doctors say, well, if you have high LDL, you must have some kind of a heart disease, right? And now fast forward many years later, LDL must cause heart disease. That's not really the case, right? That's like flies cause poop, right? Flies don't cause poop. If there's poop, flies are gonna come, right? If you have problems with your cardiovascular system, if your body is functioning the way it should be, you're gonna increase your LDLs because your body's trying to protect you. So you, a better thing to do than to take some kind of statin to lower your LDLs is, to take care of your cardiovascular system. One way to do that is by exercise. Another way to do that is by increasing your vitamin C intake, right? There's, there's other ways that we could discuss, but time does not allow. But again, I'm happy to talk about it with anybody who wants to listen. <laughs> All right, what else we got? 50% 50, 50 less pancreatic cancers in overweight people, 72% less lung cancers in smokers, reduced melanoma in cases by up to 72%. Prevent risk and improve rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. Prevents osteoporosis. Increase new bone formation, right? Same sort of thing. Increase strength and flexibility and balance. Decrease gallbladder uh, removal by up to 20%. If 
by the way, if anybody has got gallstones, right, drop me a note because uh, I got a nice story about how uh, medical doctors want to take my gallbladder out because I had gallstones and I uh, obviously I kind of knew what I was doing and fixed it myself and you can too. So you don't listen to a medical doctor that wants to remove your gallbladder. Get a second opinion if that is uh, the case. Decrease gallstone formation. Okay. Improve digestion and decrease indigest indigestion. Improve bowel function and elimination. Increase immune system function. All right, very important. Okay. Increase macrophage right? activity and antioxidant levels. Okay. Uh, decrease all case mortality by 67%, right? That's huge. Decrease all cause, all cause mortality by 50% in the elderly population. Prevent up to 40% 7% less cognitive impairment. Right? Prevent up to 62% of Alzheimer's and 52% of dementia. Okay, better physical function in older adults. Decrease chance of ever being in a nursing home. Decrease rate of aging. Okay, enhance learning capacity by up to 12 times. Right, if you, anybody who has kids, right, that, that could be something that might be useful for them. <laughs> Increase serotonin levels, right, that feel good hormone. Decrease depression by 20%, right? So a brisk walk a day is far better than Prozac. And there are no side effects, no bad side effects or good effects. Decrease growth and healing hormones and decrease stress and body breakdown hormones and decrease risk of weight gain and obesity. Ah, we made it to the end, right? So that's a ton of things just by doing a 30 minute walk. Again, brisk walk, not a run, just a brisk walk a day. So. I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, it's a quote by Deepak Chopra that I love. Uh, it says, uh, in our willingness to give that which we seek, we keep the abundance of the universe circulating in our lives. Why I put this in? Because I'm glad that I got all you guys to come and spend an hour with me uh, to go over this. But there's so many more people out there suffering. So I would ask you uh, to share this information with anybody you know that could use it and pretty much everybody can use it. Uh, I'm gonna be probably posting this on my YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, again, if you ask me for a link, I'm happy to send it to you. It'll probably also be on my Facebook page as well. Um, but the, the take home message is, right? Drugs and surgery, they're a lie, right? In, in very rare cases, do they provide any kind of actual healing, right? Uh, they, they're needed in emergency situations when the body's capacity to heal uh, is is not a, at, at the rate uh, of with the, with the body's breaking down, right? Like in a, in a car accident or something like that. But the body is your best chance of healing. And if we honor what the body is supposed to do, right? That, that, that's your best chance for living a productive, vibrant life, okay? So um, I hope you guys found this informative and useful. Uh, I'm gonna be doing my next lecture, I think on thyroid function. So anybody uh, interested in that, it's gonna be next month. And again, just drop me a note and I'll put you on my, uh, on my list uh, for, for the thyroid lecture. And it's gonna be, it's one of my most popular lectures because thyroid uh, dysfunction is, is so rampant and, uh, and people just don't know what to do, uh, to, how to help themselves. So um, look forward to that, all right? So there's all my stuff, right? My website, drscottjan.com. Um, and you can reach me at pretty much all your social medias, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Dr. Scott, Doc Scott Jan. Okay, uh, my email is, you can get that through my website. It's, uh, it's just doc, D-O-C, at drscottjan.com. All right. Uh, thank you guys for attending. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Um, and again, if I missed anything or if you have any questions, drop me a note and I'm more than happy to, uh, oops, sorry, didn't mean to put that there. I'm more than happy to help you guys out as uh, best I can. All righty. All right. Thank you very much. And I guess I will see you guys next month. Take care.